Hey Urbana, thanks for joining us. We're live on Periscope. Um, especially uh, special welcome to those of you who are watching at home, hashtag Urbana15 at home. Uh, we know a ton of you, thousands of you are, are streaming with us, so we thank you. Um, we have a really awesome, exclusive, behind the scenes uh, conversation with some of our, our speakers. And so uh, we're gonna be facilitating um, just a great conversation with David Platt, Evelyn Reicher, and Patrick Fung. And uh, we'll have free-flowing conversations. So if you're on live, we want to uh, get your questions, your comments. So Brittany is at the camera. She'll be reading your questions and comments. So if there's any question you want to ask uh, to this panel, uh, you can ask it. Otherwise, we're just going to have a nice, informal conversation together. Um, and also, you want to spread the word. If you swipe up on Android or you swipe right on iOS, you could share this, spread the word. Uh, we're going to talk for maybe 15 minutes or so or see whatever the spirit leads, and we'll do, we'll do what we do. Sounds um, good. Thanks so, for the share, UAMB. Oh, yeah. Okay, so some people joining us that came yeah. that were on seminar yep, yep, yep. before. All right. Getting well, some hearts and some love. All right, give us love. Share us. <laughs> um, so um, one of the cool things um, about uh, this panel of three speakers is uh, we're going to get to hear from them. We've already heard from Dr. Fung from the platform, um, powerful words. Uh, but one of the cool things that maybe a lot of you Urbana attendees don't know is that they've been preparing this not only for a long time individually, but they've also been uh, preparing for this conference together. So I thought, I mean, I would love to hear what's been your experience um, preparing uh, what you've been sharing, uh, preaching about uh, together. What have you been learning from each other? What's been some of the interactions you've had together been like? Mm -hmm. share yes. so one of the great experience I had at the speaker's retreat, so to speak, that was in August, was that we were asked us to present a brief talk of every talk we will present here. And the great experience was to learn from others because they would critique uh, each speaker's talk. And uh, it's great to be critique and each talk and uh, learning from each other and gaining their insights. That was good. It's also a very humbling experience. Uh, we're being transparent, being vulnerable, being corrected by others, being culturally sensitive as well. I think I don't live in North America, but listening to people from North America, listening to them, if I give this illustration, it may be offensive in the North American context. I think learning together, I think that, that was the real rich experience for me, the community of learning together. Yeah, I, I just want to thank so much uh, just Urbana for taking such good care of the speakers. Uh, a lot of my friends already have said, wow, you know, if we prepare a conference, we want to do that. Because I feel like as a speaker, we've been really supported and, and we had great times of prayer as well at, at actually the, the speakers retreat and just roommating with other speakers. I, you know, I get to know better Katie, which is really a great experience. And so we have been able to pray for each other, actually as we were preparing for Urbana. So I think, yeah, bravo Urbana in French. Huh? So <laughs> <laughs> bravo Urbana, because you are amazing host for your speakers. So. It really is one of the unique things about this conference is that it provides that speaker's retreat a few months before, then even time here, it provides unique opportunity to, to really sharpen one another, spur one another on toward Christ, even in ways that I think are helpful in the time here at Urbana, but then even beyond that, um, as we're all serving in different places in the world um, uh, to have that partnership, friendship partnership that we can build on as we're doing the work of mission and ministry together that, that flows from uh, the relationships that are formed during this time. Yeah, and I, I, Real quick, oh, yeah, so yeah. Damon wants you to know, Mr. Platt, that he will never forget you speaking at Urbana 12. And Dr. Fung, real quick, some, one of our viewers wants to know as an inspiring preacher, what is a key component in speaking truth to your audience? Uh, I think really study the word. I think uh, when I first became a Christian, what really changed my life was the word of God. Mm -hmm. What still changed my life is still the word of God. And I think hold on to the word, study the word. But I remember, you know, what the Bible talks about is not just learning the word, but obey the word live out that message as well. So I think learning, obeying, and having time. So for this conference, actually, I applied for leave for one whole week, or actually 10 days from my organization for OMF. I just say, I want to spend time thinking, praying, preparing for the message. So I had one week, a personal retreat, mm -hmm. just uh, from the 11th of December, mm -hmm. uh, for that 10 days, just to pray for a banner, and just 
I felt God was just really helping me. So I think that is, that is very, very important. Yeah. Well, and maybe on all that line, I wonder if you could share um, what are some of your practices, personal practices for scripture in your life? What's been helpful for you in terms of whether it's devotional practices or just different spiritual disciplines that you've incorporated? Yeah. yeah, of course, I think uh, that's the basis of our life. I mean, that's the wisdom that we get for our daily lives. So there are specific books, of course, for, like, for example, I love the book of Proverbs, and I learned this from one of my friends who was a business person, who says, actually, he, he reads the book of the Proverbs uh, every every month just to, to inquire wisdom. So there are different books also for different seasons and for just different things. So for me, I think... Uh, the, the Bible is the foundation, and especially as um, as I've often been thinking about uh, the global events uh, that we go through, you know, I mean, I go back, I find myself go back very often and reading the newspapers with the Bible and back and forth, and just looking to try to gain wisdom, not just for my own personal life, spiritual life, as I do in my devotion every day when I read the Bible and pray, but also integrate it in my my reflections on actually what is happening. Like I got that from one of my professors, you know. He said read the Bible and read the newspapers. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. So. I benefit deeply from a Bible reading plan. That's helpful for me. Uh, so I use a Robert Murray McShane Bible reading plan. You can do it two chapters a day, four chapters a day. I mean, you can do it one or sixteen chapters. You can do as many as you want. But uh, it's it's just helpful for me. There's Old Testament and New Testament reading built into that, and so just seeing the whole of Scripture, seeing how it ties together, but that daily intake from the Word. And then I, I like journaling. Uh, so daily, I'll spend time journaling, just reflecting on the Word, writing down observations, application from the Word, trying to guard my heart against just listening and not obeying, as uh, Patrick was talking about. So uh, that's, I mean, it's simple, but most, by far the most important time in my life is that time in the morning and that Bible reading plan and the prayer that flows from that. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing I want to add is that yeah, the Bible reading plan is very, very good, so we follow those and uh, reading several passages. But sometimes I find another discipline is helpful and sometimes God allows us to dwell on a verse, read that verse again the next day, again the next day, and let God speak to us because sometimes God speak, you know, through the word not just a whole passage, but maybe a particular verse, and allow God to speak to us through that as well. So there are different ways of approaching the Word of God. But stay faithful to the Word, I think, study the Word faithfully. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily need a lot of commentaries, scholarly books. I mean, those are helpful, but I think, again, go back to the Word first. Read the Word, let God speak to us. You know, is something I'm still learning. Uh, you know, us, just very much like a new Christian, learning to, to read the Word again fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, we're here on Periscope with Patrick Fung, who's the president of Overseas Missions Fellowship, uh, Dr. Evelyn Reicher, who's a professor of Islamic studies at Fuller's uh, School of Intercultural Studies, and David Platt, who's the president of the International Mission Board. So if you want to ask us a question on Periscope, feel free to chat, type in. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, you all another question. Um, part here at the Urbana Missions Conference, um, we've been wrestling with lots of hard issues. Um, Already, just the first day, we've talked about the Syrian refugee crisis. We've talked about um, issues here in the United States and Canada around race. Um, we are uh, just a couple miles from Ferguson, where just a place of incredible pain and hurt. And I think one of the things that a lot of us who are on social media, we're just confronted with so much brokenness and pain, both domestically and then overseas. And sometimes there's a, or at least I feel, a tension between uh, the issues here at home that we face and then caring for the issues abroad and like over there. And so one of the things I think at Urbana, we're in that tension of how do we balance those or how do we hold those together? So I would love to hear thoughts of how you personally navigate it or how your uh, uh, missionary, your organizations think about both the domestic and the overseas issues of justice, issues of brokenness, and, and holding those together. I'll throw a couple thoughts out there. I think it can be all, almost overwhelming to the point of being debilitating uh, to hear all these needs in the world and just think, okay, what am I supposed to do? Or just to almost become uh, so inundated with seeing this news or this news or this news that you almost just become numb to it in a sense. And so there's real dangers that I think we have to guard against. So how do we guard against those? 
Uh, just some practical things that, that I try to do that I would encourage students to do is one, to let information always drive you to prayer. Um, and prayer is, is simple, but it, the Lord has ordained prayer as a means by which we participate with Him in what He is doing in the world. And so when I think about refugees who right now might be in the middle of a raft uh, in the Aegean Sea, like, how can I, what can I do? I, one thing I can do is call out to God for His mercy and His grace and His provision for there are things I can do right now in prayer for them, for all these different issues. And so to let them drive you to greater intimacy with the Lord and, and, and participation with Him, intercession and, and prayer. And then when it comes to action, not, no one of us can act on all these issues. I mean, we can't help Syrian refugees address race issues in this part, this city, this city, this city. Um, help orphans over here, address abortion over there, like, I mean, the, the social injustices are, and, but what we can do is go to the Lord and say, what are you leading me to do? What are you uniquely calling me to do? And to, to look at your life, sphere of influence, the opportunities that are around you, the gifts you have, and say, how can I be a, a light in a world of injustice? How can I be proclaim truth? How can I proclaim the gospel faithfully? And then live out the implications of the gospel and apply to those different issues. And then think through, what is one practical thing? Now, I've got to solve all these things, but what is one practical thing I can I can do in obedience to, to the Lord? Yeah, for me, I, I really echo what David said early on about proclaiming the gospel. I think that, that's really, really foundational. I think we can be trying to solve all these issues from the human perspective, but I think we need to look at the gospel. What is the whole gospel? The gospel is that Jesus died and rose and will come again, that he died for us. And I think if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, the, the verse that really captured my attention was that Jesus on the cross, he destroyed the wall of hostility. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a powerful word, destroy that. You know, that's hostile. Well, hostile to God and hostile to one another. Yeah. And yet Jesus on the cross, destroy that war. And I think we need to go back to the solution. It's not just finding human solutions, but Jesus is able to bring the world together yeah. in a way that politicians cannot. That mm -hmm. unity is found in forgiveness mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. Only can, you know, we have found forgiveness in God that we can forgive one another. And I think for me personally, it's very, very um, uh, pertinent, relevant. Uh, I mean, my parents, my grandparents went through the Japanese war. I mean, Japan occupied China, occupied Hong Kong for a long time, and, and my parents suffered. And I still remember one time I was visiting some uh, Japanese uh, um, missionaries in Japan. Uh, well, actually, they are Asians working in Japan, uh, preaching the gospel. And on a Saturday afternoon, there was a kind of a, what they call a community cleaning day. So every household would be involved in cleaning the, the streets of the city. And the missionary gave me a, a proof and said, okay, you'll be involved, you know, clean the streets. So I went to a ditch and uh, just tried to clean up a mess. And when I was there, interestingly, just right there at that time I was cleaning the streets, I saw these uh, jet, you know, uh, military jets. Well, I, just, I think they were doing military practice. I was beginning to cry because immediately the memory of my parents suffering, my grandparents suffering, just, just totally overwhelmed me. And I cried, I was there standing with the broom, and I cleaned the streets for Japan. And I said, Lord, can I do it? And I came before God and said, yes, Lord, I can do it because I know you forgive me. And I know I can say to my Japan, brothers and sisters, I love you. But I think that is only possible. It's the problem the gospel is proclaimed. So I think that's very, very important. The consolation is found not just political solutions, but in Christ. I think. So I really echo what they say that we must proclaim the gospel, but we also need to also demonstrate the gospel in our lives, proclaiming by words and deeds, and also in our character, where we live our gospel to also hope. Yeah, I would like to go back to to really what attracted me to Jesus, actually, which shows His mercy and compassion. And uh, I was thinking about this recently because I was uh, writing a blog. For, for my school, for, for the theological seminary, on the current events. Uh, I'm French, and of course, uh, as soon as the Paris attack happened, I flew directly to France to be with my friends and pay tribute 
then when I came back, San Bernardino happened, and very so a lot of people on both sides, Muslims and Christians, very distressed by the situation. And I was writing this blog, and the two words that came to my mind were really mercy and compassion. And I was thinking about that. I said, why am I a Christian? You know, what has attracted me in Jesus? Uh, and it's actually his mercy and compassion. And, and that must be at the core of who I am. And, and so I feel that today, as we are facing so much injustice in many areas, whether locally, as you say, or globally, I would actually not divide global and local because we live in an interconnected world and and also all of us twitter and we have we have an example right now where actually we are very globally connected uh, sometimes of course the global makes us forget the local and that i think would, would be very sad but we have to think of how actually we can and, and the the way i this became symbolized in my thinking is when i was and i say it in the blog i wrote when I was preparing my Christmas tree and it was just after San Bernardino attack, um, uh, I, I put a little Eiffel Tower in, on my Christmas tree to remember what had happened in Paris and to remember to pray for my friends and community. But then soon I put a candle with San Bernardino in the nativity set and then I was thinking of my friends in Beirut. And it's true, I suddenly became overwhelmed. I thought my Christmas tree is gonna have so many <laughs> symbols of suffering. But then I realized that, of course, there is so much I can do, but I will do, and I will not be stopped. And I said that, actually, instead of just illuminating my Christmas tree, I want to illuminate the world, world with, with mercy and compassion that comes from God. So I think whenever we have that, that it has to be the foundation, you see, and then we build on that mercy and compassion. And then we can have even this morning, sitting in the session and, and talking about race, you know, if I really have that mercy and compassion, it's going to lead me necessarily and really, uh, it, I have to do, I have to do acts of mercy and compassion wherever I go. And I think the beauty of the new generation is that you can do it globally and locally. Um, and you can navigate this world very well. So. That's great. Yeah, we have a viewer, Eagle Lead from Queens, New York, who said thanks for that quote, Evelyn, about connecting like global and local and not um, forgetting the interconnectedness between those. We did have a question from a viewer um, about is there a balance between right doctrine and practice? And if there is, what does that look like for you? I think there's definitely a relationship. I don't know. Uh, between doctrine and practice in a that we're tempted to miss. So I think that's the whole point of the book of James is he's saying, I mean, you say you have faith, but you have no deeds. Uh, show me your faith without deeds. I'll show you my faith by what I do. That faith works. Um, so right doctrine must lead to right practice. And right practice needs to be fueled by right doctrine. So, by, so it's truth flowing out in grace and compassion and work and and so I think we always want to make sure, I, where I'm hesitant to use the word balance is I don't really want to be zealous on both. Um, so not I want to pull back one in order to compensate for the other. I want to be, I want to know truth. I want to walk in the word. I want to, I want to know the gospel. I want to know the truth that the Lord has given us in his word. And I want to be zealous like a lot of truth in my life. But then I want there to be a lot of work that flows from that truth, a lot of action, uh, compassion, love, mercy, uh, bold obedience, uh, contrite courage. Uh, I mean, these are things that I, I pray for in my life that I want to be evident in my life. And so I want to be zealous in that, that way as well. And I think, uh, I think scripture, when rightly read and understood, calls us to Good theology leads to good mission practice. I would emphasize uh, probably the relational aspect. Um, and and I, I want to explain that because, of course, as, as you introduced me, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research on, on Muslim-Christian relations. And I've seen a lot of people defending very well that their doctrines um, and very sophisticated and very, you know, bold in their defense, but 
couldn't really communicate in the heart of the other that maybe has different questions. So I would encourage people to actually practice their doctrine in the context of relationship. And that will mean like, let the other respond. Let the other say, you know, oh, I don't understand. I see that, for example, on campus when I started uh, talking with Muslims and you know I was all set in my doctrines and I knew what I thought about God then suddenly I had a still face people didn't understand so I I hope that we are not imprisoned by the doctrine in such a way that we cannot be able to help others understand and find words that are so simple uh, so real, so touching the hearts of people. Um, and that's practice, and, and that's listening, and listening to the people who have questions. And I think my doctrine is actually about God. It's shaped by my wrestling with Muslims as they ask me questions about the Trinity, about other things. And I love that. It's, it's, okay, doctrine is alive. It's about God. It's about who is God. And so it's very relational, it's very, um, it, yeah, it's, there is life into it. And, and, and I think the best example for me is a discussion between a Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And that, that was doctrine, wasn't it? I mean, that was a piece of theology, like huge. Like, uh, because Jesus was revealing to this Samaritan woman, and I don't know if everybody <laughs> knows the story, but it's in John 4 in the Bible. Well, this first, this woman had a question, a simple conversation between Jesus and a woman. Jesus is thirsty. Are we, are we humble in our presentation of our doctrine? Are we vulnerable? Are we asking water for somebody who is gonna maybe think differently from us and then provide this space where we can talk about, when Jesus, Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, he talked about his nature talked about who he is, he talks about real worship, that was doctrine. But it was so simple, it was so beautiful, it was so relational, and it was so transformative. For, so this is for me how I would actually see and give an example of the relationship between doctrine and work. So, yeah. Well, um, do we have any more questions? Um, we have a closing one, unless... Yeah. Okay, well, let, I, I have one question, and then that'll be the closing. Okay, sure. I, I think it's, it's okay. It might be comical or something. It's about how the our conference could be praying for you guys. Ah, okay, okay. So I will. That'll be the last question. You can think about that. But I like to ask you this question: If you could go back to who you were when you were in college, most of our attendees are undergraduate, eighteen to twenty-two year olds. Um, if you go back to your college self and give yourself advice or <laughs> exhortation, <laughs> what would you say to yourself? <laughs> well, one, okay, clearly, like I came to a conference that, yeah, like InterVarsity. I was at the GBU in France, so uh, InterVarsity in France. I was always wrestling with this question where does God want to send me? And I mean, it was. It was, I, all my energy was, I knew because when I had I, um, accepted Jesus in my life when I was 13, I had a very strong call to mission. So I was bringing that call everywhere, but the big question when I, when I was at the time when you make big decisions for life, whether marriage or whether uh, your job, is, Lord, do, I, do you want me to go overseas? Do you want me to be here? Oh Lord, I'm so nervous. I don't know, I want to give a clear, clear mm -hmm. answer. Sometimes God does, sometimes he does not. <laughs> and I think he wants us to grow into that. And so maybe sometimes, I, I have had these turning points at, at conferences like Urbana, where I felt like, yeah, this is the next step, I have to go. And sometimes I had just to commit myself, and I, that's what I would say to me. Just commit yourself to follow God. And maybe he will show it at the conference, which he did, he used some conference to show me. Because when I see how God has been working in my life, I got that call very early to mission when I was 13. Then very early to the mission, uh, to the Muslim context. Now it's 40 years afterwards. And when I look back, I just saw that God was faithful 
and he was just leading me step by step, sometimes big steps, sometimes small steps. So what I would say to me, be faithful to God. He's going to lead your life. So commit your life to God. For me, I think over the years I learned one thing, and that is the, the truth about less is more. Less is more. I'm saying a lot more no than before. I mean, as students, we want to do all kinds of things. We want to do great things for God. You know, we're excited. We want to do everything for God. And in the end, we can't focus very well. And sometimes we get restless by doing just one thing. As we're doing one thing, we think, okay, what next can I do? What next? You know, I want to do a, a lot of things for God. And I think we have, that, that's a noble ambition, you know, trying to be good trying to do everything for him. But I think, I, I like the title of a book by Eugene Patterson. It says, Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Mm -hmm. I think it's a powerful, powerful title because I think sometimes we get restless very quickly. We want to change course, but God often calls us to one thing. And I think of servants of God used by God you know, in the past 20 years. I think of Hudson Taylor, I think of other, you know, I can quote many, many examples. They are passionate about one thing. Of course, all of them are passionate about proclaiming the gospel. But one thing, they focus and not lose hope, even though they you know, face challenges. And passionate and long obedience in the same direction. So less is more. Don't try to do a million things. <laughs> focus well. That's what calls you to. Okay. I, uh, I've got a variety of regrets. For <laughs> <laughs> uh, and two of the big ones were one, I, uh, I I never got plugged into a local church, and I really regret that. Um, I was involved in campus ministry, which was which was huge as far as ministry on that campus, um, but I, the intergenerational, uh, multi-dimensional care that God has designed for his people in a local body of believers is just, I think, non-negotiable in the Christian life, and I missed it. Um, and my Faith in a variety of ways suffered as a result, and so I think that was a core issue that I that I wish I had done differently. And then, second, um, I wish I had been more intentional in ministry among the international community on the college campus. I just I missed it. My last semester, I uh, uh, talking about relationships with people who. I uh, had a lot of different beliefs than me and were a lot different culturally from me um, who had just moved over just to study. That's one of the things I love about Urbana is just a uh, more multi-ethnic picture than many conferences uh, today. And uh, I just, at that last semester, and I just realized what a, I mean, they were so open to the gospel, many of them who never even heard it. Mm -hmm. And they were so open to it. And I thought, why did I not, why was I not more intentional sharing the gospel and just being a friend to people who are uh, who are new to a culture, new to a setting, would love just that kind of friendship. And the, the effects that it had even on my faith, my faith, uh, were hugely helpful. Um, so that, those are two of my, my bigger regrets. So. That's great. And last question, how can we as Urbana be praying for you all uh, for the next couple of days? And at the can you also add one book recommendation? Oh, okay, okay. As you share your prayer request. So my uh, one book recommendation, uh, I probably, my thought, that favorite book, most influential book, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Mm -hmm. um, I read and reread that book all the time. So if you haven't read Knowing God by J.I. Packer, I would highly recommend it. Uh, and then uh, praying, I, I would just ask you pray. I, I, uh, when I preach this week, uh, my focus is on reclaiming the gospel and praying that the Lord would draw people to Christ uh, at this conference and uh, uh, for the first time. And so I would just ask you to pray for uh, yeah, supernatural anointing toward that end. I'm just praying that the Lord would, I, I, I'm, I'm praying for this week, the Lord would save many and send many. And, uh, and so I would appreciate your prayers for that. Um, yeah, I would like to pray really for, pray for me, of course, but really I, I such a burden for the students here and for those who are 
coming to this conference and I just had su such amazing conversations with people and so just for these conversations we have that you know um, together as we are meeting one another maybe even some divine appointments uh, you know the Lord maybe is new to one person that maybe needs and so just having that sensitivity to one another listening to one another so that when people uh, who maybe come here and are, are discouraged or have heavy burdens that they find somebody and who listens to them so so for that, of course, for my speech tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a book recommendation? Uh, actually, I, I would encourage not necessarily a book. But I would, I, I would, that's that's me, the professor speaking. <laughs> read as much as you can on us in Christian relations. It's very needed these days. But read broadly in terms of uh, don't stick to one view. There are many different approaches, many different uh, views, and uh, the, the the question is very complex. So I would actually recommend that immersion and stuff. We need that. We need to understand each other, and you need to know how to listen to one another. Yeah, for me, I think of the, the verse in Acts 13, 36, uh, Paul says, you know, when David has served God's purpose in his generation, he fell asleep. Serving God's purpose in his generation. I have been praying for students, and I just want us to pray for students here that God may serve. Uh, the students may serve his purpose mm -hmm. in our generation, then we can fall asleep. And I think for all the speakers here, whether plenary or seminars, all the things that we may be channels of God's grace, to just encourage students to serve his purpose. The students will listen to God. That's very, very important. So pray for all of us uh, who are involved in speaking, and other people, whether they in, you know, work in the front or the back, mm -hmm. that we are praying the students may serve God's purpose. I still, actually, you, you stole my book. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would change that. There's, please, there are many new books out there, which is good. Go and read them. But go back and read some classics as well. Would Find you know what the classics are? Would you are. include? Well, J.I. Packer's book is one, and there are many classic books by John Stott, uh, The Missions of God, very thin book. I think it's in a different format now. I think different title even. But there are many classical books that are on missions that really encourage the students and. Uh, yeah, those books, uh, they are of really good value. Go and read those books. It still speaks powerfully today. It's still very relevant today. Or like that long obedience right. in the same yep. Yes, that that's, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. yep. That's what that, one, that's our, our, one of our viewers science, anticipated yeah. that book you would recommend. <laughs> but also go and buy those $5 books. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 the book of the day. Yes. Yes. Go and yes. buy those yes. as well. Yep. Well, thank you all for your time and your ministry and serving us. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. you. And so thank you all for watching. Um, so we're going to be back on Periscope throughout today and the uh, next couple of days. Um, and most importantly, join us tonight for our plenary evening session. We have uh, Francis Chance and Michelle Higgins that will be speaking. It's going to be a powerful evening. Um, the session officially starts at 730. Uh, but if you want to tune in at 715, uh, you can catch some pre-session worship. And uh, we'll also be hosting a Periscope pre-game show starting at 645 on Periscope. <laughs> So the live stream is www.urbana.org, and you could go here for the Periscope pregame show with myself, Brittany, and Brad. Uh, so thanks all.